All right, let's open it up, guys. Okay. Well, right there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Scott, um, talk to me about how you're feeling. CBS debut. Um, let's, let's address that first. How do you think things went? What does this mean for Bellator? Should we expect more? Yeah, I mean, um, I had a lot of CBS executives here. I think they love the show. Uh, it's honestly surprising how many first-time fans or first-time they've come to a live event. I think they all had an uh, amazing experience. So I think we gained a lot of fans here. And, you know, we'll, we'll remain cautiously optimistic uh, for some good ratings and see how it goes. What were your thoughts on the main event? Yeah, I mean, listen, um, when, I, when I think about Fedor and his accomplishments, and I was telling this to Josh and Randy and Dan and, and all the guys that were in the cage, I said, you know, you guys have already done it all. Fedor has already done it all. He didn't need to fight. He doesn't need to do anything, right? So anytime he fights another fight, I think for the last three, four years, it's really been uh, a special occasion. It's an event. You, you, you could feel it, right? When he fights, it's an event, right? But he doesn't need to prove himself. He's already done. He's already to me. He's the greatest heavyweight of all time. Would I've liked to see him and Randy fight before? Sure. Him and Josh, of course. But if you look at the string of fights uh, that he had in Pride during his his heyday run, it was just incredible. I went back and I watched it. It was him and Nogueira, and him and Krokop, him and Randleman, him and Hunt, him and just per, you know fighter after fighter that was just a killer. So. He's already done it all, and to me, he has nothing to prove. He, he's, you know, he, he's a very, he's, a, he's, the, he's the legend. And I was telling him when he left, I said, it's such an honor for me to promote you. Because not just the way, not just because of how he fights and his, you know, his popularity, but really just how he carries himself, right? And, you know, to me, he's a true martial artist, and I'll always be a Fedor fan. Would you say he's the greatest heavyweight of all time? Absolutely. You know, you can't you can't compare anybody else's body of work to to what he's done over the last, you know, 18 years or so. You know, there's there's moments in time and there's spurts of runs, but nobody's been has has had a run like that. So, in my opinion, uh, he fought the best fighters in the world that were fighting in Japan at that time. They weren't fighting here. The best fighters in the world, you know, if you guys remember back in the Pride days, were all fighting in Japan. And, and he went through them all. He did not duck anybody. Anybody, Saki Bar asked him to fight, anybody. We asked him to fight, he's, he's always said yes. He's always accepted the challenge. So he's, he's, a, he's a, a real, real true champion. And to me, he's the GOAT. And last one for me, uh, your middleweight champion, Johnny Eblen. Um, what do you think of his performance and where he stands in the world right now at 185 pounds? I mean, I think he's, I think he's the best uh, light heavyweight in the planet. And... That guy is so talented. I think you're just seeing the beginning of this kid. And when he, when he fought Gegard, I said, wow, he got my attention. You know? And then tonight he got my attention because you know, his, his opponent was no joke. That guy is tough. And he just kept grinding him and grinding him and grinding him and just you know, working him. And he, he broke him down, basically, to a guy that I really didn't think to break him down was possible. So hats off to Johnny Eblen, man. He's, he's going to do a lot of great things in the sport. Hey, Scott. Um, do you have a favorite Fedor fight? You know, I'll tell you. I went back. I, I have f several moments in, in, in the Fedor fights that were great fights. I mean, when I think about the Randleman fight, you know, when he got, when he got dumped, I, I was like, oh, my God. I thought, like, he, he died. <laughs> like, he, he fell right on his neck. And then he got up like nothing and just, you know, and then and took him down and did what he had to do. But so um, I, I think... If you look at some of his one-punch knockouts, the Arlovsky fight, looked like he just swatted Andre right out of the air, you know? And uh, for lo the longest time, when I was looking for K1, and I had the opportunity to go see these fights live in Japan, and I, I started calling him the sharpshooter because the guy is so fast, so explosive, through so, so many great combinations back in the day. And, um, you know, I, I think those are my two moments of Fedor fight. The Noguera fight was a great fight. Krokot was a great fight. And to me, Krokot was something interesting because, you know, Murko was known as a much better striker. And he was a K1, you know, uh, runner-up and just this beast from Croatia. And uh, a lot of people thought he was going to take it to Fedor. And Fedor just marched him down and started doing his thing. It was a great fight. But to me, that's when I said, oh, wow, this guy is super talented. So, um, when I, when, I, when I think about how well-rounded he is, it's, it's pretty pretty amazing. You've kind of already alluded to it, but like 
when Fader inter- enters a room, when he's around, there's, there's a different aura, there's a different mm-hmm. energy. Mm-hmm. What do you think that is? You know, that's something you just can't, you can't put your finger on it. It's like some athletes have it and some people don't. Some are great fighters, some have great charisma, some do both, right? And uh, he is, this guy, I'm telling you, I've been with him in Japan, I've been with him in Europe, I've been with him in Russia, I've been with him in Santa Monica here. It's he, the guy still garnishes that type of attention. You know, people are like, oh my God, that's Fedor. And then, you know, freaking out. And uh, we had people flying from all over the world. We had ticket orders from the Middle East, from Japan, from Europe, uh, South America, to come watch his fight. And, you know, being that his last fight, they wanted to see it in person. And and uh, it, it was, you know, it, it, it wasn't a great fight, but it was a, a great event. And, and, and he's retired now, so... I think he should he should be retired and you know and and be Fedor. My final question is: uh, Brand Ward has been calling for a Dalton Rasta fight. Dalton Rasta said he accepts. It is up a division, but um, is that a fight that you would entertain? You know, I'll tell you. Uh, I watched uh, the Ward fight and uh, I thought he did a great job. I I didn't think Brandon could kick to the head that high, <laughs> but you know he's a great puncher and, and great wrestler. Um, I'd say let's go back and, 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 and meet with my fight team and then reshuffle the deck and, and see what we come out with. But, you know, I, I'm so happy for him on a personal level because about a year and a half ago when he wanted to come back, he was going through a lot of turmoil in his life. And, you know, a lot of people turned their back on him. And, and he and I sat down up in the stands at the Mohegan Sun in one of the fights. We just had a, heart, a heart-to-heart conversation. And I, I, I said, look, you know, you gotta, you got to keep it together. And, and, and he has. And this is very important to him. And, and you could tell how hard he trained for this fight. I mean, he was in great shape. So he's doing his part now. And, you know, I want him to keep, keep on that path. And I think if he does, you know, good things will happen for him. Hey, Scott. Mm-hmm. Kay Williams for Can Chronicles Media. Um, mm-hmm. 2022, it was an exceptional year for the Bellator promotion. What are some of your early projections in terms of success and fights moving forward for the year 2023? I agree with you. 2022 was, I think, you know, victory after victory after victory. We had an amazing Bantamweight tournament that's going to end here. Uh, probably, we'll probably have something to announce in another week or so. Um, and just the fights and the quality of fights, and really it's a testament to the roster. If you think about how long... Uh, we've been building this roster. It's, probably, it's been a, a good five years now that we've started putting together the, the talent that we have today. And it's been a lot of fun, honestly, to sit down with the fight team and put these matches together because, you know, these guys are at such an elite level of, of, of fighting in mixed martial arts. It's impressive to watch. But um, when you think about 23, <coughs> you know, I mean, come on, does it get any better than starting out 23 with Fedor's retirement fight and being live on CBS? I mean, I think, I think that Johnny Evelyn became a star tonight, and uh, and so did Brandon Moore. You know, he could get some more shine on his light, and you know, let's see what happens in the future. But to starting off with uh, this fight, it was very special, and uh, you know, we have a big fight in Ireland with Amosov, who's coming off the war the Ukrainian uh, fighter that was fighting in the war. And which you, if you guys haven't seen that story, it's very, very emotional, man. The stuff that he's gone through, the stuff that he's seen. When you start seeing the feature pieces of the, you know, the real-time situation that he was fighting over there, it's, re- it's very, very enlightening. And you know, we're just very special, you know, to, to have him back and be, be fighting. And he brought his wife and his child, and now he's living in America now. So... Uh, he's going to have, a, I think, a great career. He's fighting at Logan Storley. Gegard's coming back March 10th. I mean, honestly, this lightweight tournament, I'm so excited. I think this is the toughest lightweight tournament in the history of mixed martial arts. And, you know, we're going to let those guys all get it on. And, and when I look at that gauntlet of athletes that we had up on, this, up on the stage yesterday or at the press conference, I think there's a couple dark, hor- dark horses that, that might take this tournament, you know, that maybe not might be shining out right now. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. So I, I think it's a great year, way to start the year, and, you know, we're going to do some great fights this year. <clears throat> Scott, here. Other side. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, a few days ago, you said that and was Anderson Silva was offered to fight Feather, and since it's such a special occasion, let's fight, Feather's fight. How many options did you have? How close was 
uh, the deal with NSO to get done? And uh, was Bader the second option? Do we have another option like Verdun? I don't know. How, how, how was the negotiation? Yeah, I'll tell you. Um, we basically talked to Ed Suarez and said, look, we would think this would be an amazing fight. The two goats of MMA fighting in the last fight in MMA. <clears throat> And uh, he came back a couple of days after and said, you know, he, he's not interested. He wants to pursue his boxing now. And MMA is very hard on his body. So that was the reason. We said, okay, we moved on. And, and that was it. There was not any back and forth negotiation. It wasn't, it wasn't anything like that. So it was a, a moment in time. We had a quick conversation. Uh, it didn't work out. And then when I talked to Fedor, he didn't know I was talking to Anderson. He, he didn't know anything at that time. But every time I talked to Fedor, he just said, I want to fight Ryan Bader and I want to fight for the belt. And Fader's been on a run, so it was hard to keep saying, well, you know, Fader maybe should fight somebody else. And he, he was very adamant about fighting. And, and after all, you know, after, the, after everything he's done for the sport, I felt like he deserved it, so we put it together. Perfect. Last one for me. Um, tonight, you were just saying about CBS, but at the same night, you guys just uh, did start the partnership with uh, Combat in Brazil, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask you about that. First of all, what the, the Bellator plans for Brazil? Mm -hmm. Since now you guys are, are on mm -hmm. combat, are you planning to, to bring a Bellator to Brazil this year? Is there any kind of special thing for Brazilian fans? Yeah, I, t I tell you what, I I'm very excited because, to be honest and transparent, we were going to go there before COVID hit. And we had plans to go there in 21. And then when COVID hit in 20, and maybe even end of 20, we, we were going to go to Brazil because uh, we feel like that's a great market for, I mean, obviously, so many great fighters. And we have so many great champions that are Brazilian. Um, and I think they really appreciate the sport and they understand the sport. Um, so we were going to go there. And then COVID hit. Everything got shut down. We're doing fights in a, in a closed environment. Uh, and then uh, we, we basically rebooted. Uh, to start doing live fights. It's only been about a year, if you think about it. It's only been about a year since we rebooted, you know, doing live events. And um, everywhere we go, I think our tennis is growing. I think we're, you know, breaking attendance tennis records in different places for Bellator. Uh, and, you know, Combatant was something that was important because we do want to go to Brazil. We do want to fight. Is it going to happen this year? I'm not sure. It's something that we're definitely in dialogue. But I think Combatant will be a great partner for us. And I think we have a lot of goals that are similar. And I think our goals are aligned. And they're not. we're not just looking for a, a TV partner. We're looking for a complete media partnership. And I think they're going to be a, a very, good, good, very good partner for us. Scott, back here. Mm -hmm. One quick one for me. So you, you spoke about the roster. You guys brought Brandon Ward back. How do you guys go about canvassing fighters and bringing new talent to, to Bellator? You know, this is something that uh, I think we're really good at. And if you look at back at even when I was, uh, when I founded Strikeforce, we basically went to all the different managers, all the different gyms, all the different, you know, wrestling programs and, and ju judo programs and start talking to all the different talent managers. And we started you know, meeting people and finding what we felt was a good fit. And sometimes if you're a great fighter, that, that's not enough. Sometimes you need to have a little bit more than just being a great fighter. And, and what I mean by that is one thing I learned in Japan was there's always that X factor. You know, what is a fighter bringing more to the table than just great fighters? Because it takes a lot of years to build a, a great fighter to become a, a great champion, right? So <clears throat> we started a program where we were building from the ground up and we started buying free agents from the top down. And that's exactly what we did here at Bellator. And if you look at the, some of the first acquisitions as a free agent here, uh, we went after Ryan Bader, Gegard Mustasi, Cyborg, Fedor. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's some, some pieces I felt were a good fit. But then we signed Aaron Pico, we signed AJ McKee, we signed Rafion Stotts, we signed guys that we felt like, look, let's, let's, put, let's put an investment in these athletes and build them for the next 10 fights. Maybe it takes three, three years, three and a half years. But to build an athlete from ground zero to be a fighter that can fight in your top five or top 10 even, it's going to take at least three years. Because it's, it's just it's just going to take time because they're just you know you get three fights a year, times three years you're at nine fights, and then after they get their tenth fight we kind of just okay you gotta start fighting anybody. 
Scott to your left here. Mm -hmm. um, did you get to the, the million dollar gate you were hoping for? Did, did I, I think we're a little short, but I'm I'm happy with where we ended up. So I think we're in the in the in the mid eights, yeah. and um, you know it's uh, that's a, a big accomplishment. Uh, I feel very good about it. We had a great crowd, passionate crowd, and you know I think it was a little bit late arriving because most people are used to going to fights a little later. In the evening on a Saturday night, it starts at seven. We had to start at six because that was a CBS time slot. But um, I, I was telling my friends, I said, "Wait till Fader walks out. This place is going to erupt." And and it was like, you know, when when those two guys were about to face off, it was like you could drop a pin pin in the building, man. It was it was really really amazing. I'm asking because I'm I'm wondering how how valuable Fedor was financially in mixed martial arts. Like, we, there's a lot of big money fighters, but mm -hmm. what, what did he mean financially for the events you promoted and, you know, a lot bigger picture, you know, where does he fit into the most important, like where you could build events around him and the public came and really embraced him? How unique was yeah. he in that way? I mean, listen, you know, there's fighters and then there's superstars. And Fedor is a superstar. This guy is somebody that, could go, like I said, in any continent, and he's going to be recognized. He just has this charisma about him. His fighting style, he never ducked anybody, and either he was knocking you out or you were knocking I mean, he, somebody was going to get knocked out. And people really appreciate that, that he's going to, he's not going to just lay on you for four or five rounds and, and play play that game. He is going to advance his position to take you out or submit you and, and to win. And uh, the speed and intensity and the fluidness as a heavyweight, so impressive. Um, and, and you know what, Josh, honestly, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, it's like when, when I, I was in strike force and he had multiple offers, including he could have went to the UFC, right? He could have went to, back to Pride or you know, wherever, wherever he was talking in Japan. He could have came to me. He had, he had different offers that were very lucrative and, and he gave me a chance. And really, I think that's what took Strike Force to the next level, right? Is when he came on board, because he elevates your whole brand, right? Now, now you're a company that was a Bay Area company that started with an HDNet deal, uh, and now you have Fader Mel, you know, on your roster. Now you're uh, the, you have an international spotlight on you, and he did a lot for us. And I believe that uh, him coming on board got us the uh, eventually got us the uh, the relationship with uh, CBS and Showtime back in, in the strike force days and and he's you know he's been fighting and, and doing his thing ever since so I, I'm really thankful to him I think he gave me a great opportunity when he didn't have to uh, and uh, he's been very loyal and I've been very loyal to him and we have a great relationship and and listen Fader is not it's not like he's not going to be around I mean we're going to probably work something out with him as a brand ambassadorship and, and, and have him be around because I, I just really like his like his his Bushido spirit, his martial arts, you know, spirit is very strong, man. And I just I just love it. Lastly for me, he, he spoke about that and he wanted people, if they were gonna remember him to be a sportsman who didn't talk trash, they cared about him because he competed and won. Is there a lesson in there for you and should fighters listen to that? Uh, or should you know, because he was like the trash talk MMA has too much of that. Is he is he right? Is he wrong? Where, do, where does I, I don't think there's any right or wrong. I mean, it's definitely right for him. And and to me, it worked because look what he's accomplished in his whole career. You know, he wants to go take care of business, and he did it very well. To me, better than everybody else in the heavyweight division. So, you know, he he was he had a special career, special athlete, and you know, it's you know, I, I just I just really like I said, I'm really proud to to be. You know, involved with him and promote, promote with him for the last, you know, was it the last 12 years? I've been promoting with him in and out. So it's it's been it's been a it's been a good run, man. And 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 in there, I was I was looking at Rampage and and, and all the guys and that, you know, tribute to him. I'm so happy we put that together because. You know, those are the guys, and Josh, you know, you're around back to, back, back in the you know, Saki Bar day of Pride days. It's like, these are, guys, these are the guys that built the sport, right? They, they were the golden era of MMA, and it was a much different business back then, much different economics, but they were in there grinding it out, man, every day and, and doing their thing. So um, I think Fedor appreciated a lot of the guys he fought, a lot of the guys he should have fought. It didn't happen because of different leagues and things like that, but... Um, you know, it's uh, it was a special. This will be a special moment as far as hopefully in in you know the the, the Bellator uh, flag and also for me personally. Thanks, Scott.
back here. Uh, you kind of just touched on it, I think, but you know, you've done a lot of unique kind of special things since becoming the Bellator president and everything. Like we look at the uh, featherweight Grand Prix and the draw you did, kind of going back to the glory days and everything. And then this big kind of celebration of Fedor's career at the end of the fight. Like, I'm just curious, like, why is it important for you to do these kind of more, I guess, out of the norm, you know, types of things and give respect in these ways? You know, I'll tell you, um, I think, you know, just growing up in a martial arts school, you know, and learning really the international fight promotion business, working for K1, uh, going to the pride fights, just seeing the history there and watching, basically watching the history of MMA unfold since Hoist fought in 93. That's 30 years ago. It's not a new sport. This is, I mean, it's not, a old, it's not an old sport. This is still a very new sport. So I think there has to be some history and tradition to continue. And when when I started getting calls from the first person that called me, he actually didn't make it. First person that called me was Mirko Krokop. Said I would like to come to Fedor's fight and I'd like to bring flowers and pay my respect to him. And I said, come on out. It didn't work out. He was busy and things happened and whatever. But yeah, uh, then I got a call from Randy and I got a call and I called Chuck and uh, Frank said he's coming. I said, you know what? We got to make this a special moment in time. And I think. You know, a ceremonial tribute. It's like a ceremonial tribute to Fedor laying down his gloves, that moment of retirement, you know, forever. And you know, to look back, and it's it's just amazing. And it's it was it was emotional time for a lot of people, including myself. In there it was it was it was a it was a magic moment, you know, in in my my career. Hey, Scott, Scott Coger over here. Mm -hmm. How you doing, sir? I had the pleasure of speaking to Chael Sonnen yesterday at the mm -hmm. press conference. He told me that he has never disagreed with Scott Coker once <laughs> until yesterday when you said that this lightweight Grand Prix is going to be the best lightweight tournament, the biggest lightweight tournament in MMA history. He believes that it's going to be the biggest tournament period in MMA mm -hmm. history. Would you like to update your statement? Yeah, you know what? He told me, uh, listen, when Chael talks, you got to listen. Otherwise, he's just going to keep talking. So, no, nah, I'm joking. <laughs> But, um, you know, I love Chael, and, and he's been such a great, great, uh, you know, friend and, and colleague. But um, he said to me, Coker, this is the toughest lightweight tournament in the history of MMA that you're putting together. And he said, I think there's three dark horses here. Got to love Bert, man. <laughs> Got to love Bert. I, I love Bert, man. <laughs> but, you know... Chael's the one that told me, and I said, you know, that's interesting because he calls it the toughest. I said it was, the, you know, like the best, uh, the greatest tournament of lightweights ever. But, you know, however you want to label it, it's going to be a great, great event for the, for the year for us. It's going to be all kicks off March 10th in San Jose uh, on Showtime. So we're, we got some great fights. I'm really looking forward to it, even just as a fan, to sit there and watch these fights. These guys are amazing athletes. They deserve all the respect. And... Uh, it's going to be something that we're going to have a lot of fun with. Where do you rank Bert Washington in the top three in that position? Let me tell you. Um, I'll just tell you a story about this real quick. I know Danny's giving me the dirty look right here. Get off the mic, Coker. But um, there, there was a time in the company, and we were doing fights in a closed environment, right? So we're at the Morgan Sun. And I'm sitting there, and I'm watching our team work and, and the operations team. And I've, all, I've known Bert for a while. We've talked, and we could, we could never just really get on the same page and, you know, and, and work something out. But I've always loved him because I just love his energy, and he's like a bolt of lightning, you know? And, um, and so I was sitting there in, in, in the Mohegan Sun, and I'm going, you know, this, this is really like a, uh, a moment in time that is not good because fighters are fighting where there's no audience, right? Fighters need the fans, right? Fans need the sport, right? Fans need to be there live, too. And, and I said, this is not good. I, I need something to, to, to pump these guys up. And I said, what, let me think about it. I started thinking about like, what I could do. And then my phone rang, right? I look over it, and it was Bert. I said, this is the guy. This, this, is, this, is, this is the guy. This, is, this happened for a reason, right? So I say, Bert, you're an angel because I need you to come to the Morning Sun next week. We want to make a deal with you. I need you to fire these guys up, and I need you to... Because really, it was like a fighting in a spiritless venue because there's nobody there, right? And you have some great fights. I mean, you have MVP fighting. You have Bader fighting Nemkov in a close... And there's nobody there. There's like 10 people besides officials. So that's, that's how we made a deal. And I said, man, 
Bert, you got to come. I, I need your I need your your electricity and your and your spirit. And we got to we got to jolt these guys. And he they didn't they didn't know he was coming. No one knew. And so he showed up, and he has got he's got those guys fired up. And 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 we've been working ever ever since. So that's my story with Bert.